Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Ultimate Treatment Room for Flash webinar hosted by Leo Cancer Care and Detector. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we will answer as many of these as possible at the end of the presentations. Firstly, Nietzsche Ruder, Chief Scientific Officer from Leo Cancer Care, is going to discuss his thoughts on the structure of an innovative treatment room to cope with novel flash therapy techniques. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Fiona, for arranging this uh, webinar and Marco for participating in it. And uh, so let's jump right in. Uh, I have about 15 minutes of uh, talking to a couple of things with you, and then we'll hand over to Marco. So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, proton therapy and how I see the world of flash uh, in the proton therapy space, and then the Leo um, upright treatment rooms and how that will eventually hopefully facilitate flash talk about beam delivery nozzles and image guidance. So um, not very long, about 15 minutes. And I just wanted to uh, put a disclaimer out here, the Leo technologies referred to in this presentation are under development and do not have 510K clearance. We are actively working towards the 510 uh, clearance and um, just need to put that disclaimer in and you'll see this disclaimer come up a couple of, uh, through a couple of slides through the presentation. So, Let's just start here with this slide and say, what do we know in terms of proton therapy flash and beam delivery? And what about proton therapy flash and image guidance? And these are the key points that we probably would need to do proton therapy flash using the BRAC beam. A lot of people talk about transmission uh, flash at the moment. My opinion is that we would probably be using the BRAC peak to stop the beam to reduce the dose on the other side of the target. And we would probably not be able to treat just with a single beam. So we multiple beams. Um, what do we know about uh, flash and image guidance? I, contrary to what we thought initially is that we still need, need to deliver very high conformal doses to the target. Uh, and for that, we need very accurate patient positioning and setup. And we also need probably multiple fractions. There's going to be a fair amount of tumors that if we do flash, that we probably need to do three or four or five fractions, which means uh, the image guidance need to be done on an interfraction basis, not on a single fraction treatment. Of course, these are outliers and these are just my opinions. It's not necessarily what everybody else thinks. Now, here's a, a very uh, important statement, and that's the heart of my talk, is that I do believe that fixed beam lines offer the best uh, opportunities for proton therapy flash treatments. And uh, the next couple of slides, I go through how we're going to do this and why we think uh, that's the case. So in order to start, I just have to put in here, what, is, what are the Leo uh, technologies? So Leo Cancer Care started first by developing a patient positioner that will allow the patient in a seated position or the so-called perch or semi-standing position. This device has many degrees of freedom. And here you can see a movie of the device in, in a clinical installation being used by clinicians uh, to develop the immobilization technologies and uh, uh, in, in a facility in Europe, uh, so I'm just speeding up the video here. You can see the device can rotate, rotate around the vertical axis and it can be extremely precise in a very smooth motion. I was sitting in this device the other day and when this motion occur, like rotating up and down, you absolutely cannot uh, feel that, this, that you're moving. Now, once the patient is positioned, we also have to do imaging and we are developing now, uh, this is under construction a vertical CT scan that you can see here. Here's the picture with the scanner uh, with the covers on. And uh, this scanner will then come around the patient when uh, the patient is positioned. So here's the summary of the slide on the left, shows the patient in the patient positioner with the CT scanner uh, halfway deployed in the process of scanning. I do wanna say also that we are realize the need that we also need to be able to scan in the recumbent position. And so we're also developing a conversion, uh, a device that will convert the patient position or the upright position to a supine uh, table. You can still see the base and everything is reused. It's just an insert on top of the base. And then the, the scanner can tilt through 90 degrees and we can do supine scanning. Here's a summary then of how that would look like. The patient goes in the positioner. And uh, once the patient in the position here shows the kind of upright position, at that point, we can put the CT scanner around, the CT scanner come down the patient in the immobilized state. And uh, we will always scan from the bottom up. So we deploy the scanner. 
the scanner ring is 100% balanced. It takes a, about a 10 pound force to push the scanner up in case a, uh, uh, a power failure would, would occur. And then we can put this device in front of any treatment beam. So I want you guys to understand that we started with a immobilization first, then how do you image it? And then you put that in apparatus in front of any form of radiation beam, photons, protons, carbon, helium, or B and CT neutrons, or whatever uh, radiation beam you want to use. And then of course the treatment is done by just rotating the patient. Uh, why uh, we, we're working on the clinical evidence. The clinical evidence is, is, is out there. There are several published papers it shows the, the benefit of treating thoracic patients in upright position for increased lung volume, less lung motion, head and neck. There's uh, evidence of the gravitational force on the vertebral bodies and the uh, need for less swallowing. We are working on our own IRB approved project to look at what happens to pelvic organs. And we have a uh, early evidence that the prostate position is much more stable in the upright position, not necessarily a function of uh, bladder flow uh, for the majority of patients. And uh, we also believe there's going to be less organ drift in the abdominal space. There's some papers out for that. There's many other pluses uh, in terms of upright treatments for patient comfort. Uh, patient is certainly less vulnerable uh, setting up. And uh, there's many, many workflow advantages easier ingress and egress and faster positioning. And we're working on all these things. Everything on this slide is we are working on various forms of papers, peer-reviewed papers, publications, white papers, as we do the research and go along here uh, in the process of making this a clinical reality. Here's just a quick summary slide then. What we are saying, we're not saying at the moment replacing entries. We just feel that the clinical evidence is there, that a vast number of patients I see on the right here can actually be treated in an sophisticated upright position where we have imaging at ISA Center. So then in summary, what is the opportunities for upright treatments? Easier ingress and egress. But here's the thing, and this is really the theme for today's presentation, much, much improved image guidance at ISA Center. Um, so we will have as a standard offering the dual energy CT at ISA Center. We'll have proton radiography that will lead eventually to proton CT. We're working on several proposals to do prompt PET, prompt gamma, and optical guidance. And, and the, the benefits are clear. So we'll, we'll be able to treat with smaller margins, but more on that in a couple more slides. So for proton therapy flash and beam delivery, what do we really know? And I said before that we probably would need BRAC peak, the BRAC peak for flash uh, for, uh, treatments for deep seated targets. We need more, at least uh, two or more beams. And so what do we know about proton therapy flash nozzles? So if you want to do proton therapy and do flash and we use a cyclotron, then we really know that we need to degrade the beam close to the patient. There's no ways we're ever going to get enough beam into the triple room for flash dose rate if we degrade in the classical paradigm out by the cyclotron or out in, outside far away from the patient. We probably cannot use passive scattering, old passive scattering techniques, because that again results in a too much beam loss. And, uh, and I say probably here because this is really uh, just my thoughts. We definitely need ultra fast scanning. That means we need to be able to scan a BRAC peak rather than a pristine peak. And for that, we'll need to insert a small rich filter uh, to modulate the beam energy. Right? And uh, um, we also need to insert a distal end compensator and a beam defining aperture We're using something like a proton MLC that will have to be extremely fast. Here's two pictures of a typical passive scatter nozzle, a typical scanning nozzle. And here's a picture from the uniform scanning nozzle was designed at the Indiana University facility. What is interesting here in that implementation, this, the nozzle was built to have the range shifters inside the nozzle and shifting the range close to the patient. And this was already uh, done so that they could do a insertion of these uh, range shifter plates very fast. And then came Mavion uh, with their nozzle, which is a very similar concept. They started with a uh, um, passive scatter uh, type nozzle, and then they moved to uh, the, the hyperscan nozzle. This thing in the oval here is the Mavion nozzle. And this nozzle pretty much now tells us how future flash nozzles might look like, degrade the beam right by the patient, having a fast trimmer or a, a collimator right by the patient to sharpen the beam. And uh, so, but what is that, how does that lead to flash? Or where does the flash paradigm come into this discussion? So if you look at the gantry nozzle, this space here is ex are extremely limited. 
Um, and one of the things you always try to do is to minimize the distance from the point where you enter the nozzle to the isocenter because that drives the diameter of the gantry. And I want to say that whatever I say in the next couple of slides in terms of fixed nozzles, of course, possible in gantries, but the gantry radius will increase dramatically to achieve what, what I think uh, we want to achieve in the fixed rooms. But if you look at a fixed beam room, and uh, this is our room with future, you can see I just insert the nozzle here. That nozzle is pretty empty. And it's not a problem to shift the, the Eisen center a, a meter or two downstream, providing you have the room space in the room, and most room will give you that space. And uh, then there's not much in a fixed beam nozzle, and you have the benefit, you can increase the distance. So in a fixed beam treatment room nozzle, the beam that it knows can very easily be upgraded or simply be replaced to keep track of new beam delivery methods. Uh, multiple beam delivery nozzles can be installed in the same room. It's not far-fetched to think you can slide the one nozzle out, slide the other nozzle in. You can even slide the LINAC into the space and some customers have already been asking us for, can we slide an X-ray beam into the space with the proton nozzle to combine therapy uh, treatments? So I, it's not far-fetched that in a fixed beam room, you can have the same room can be equipped to deliver flash. And uh, here's a unique idea because everything is now stationary, always in the same place. We can start using small uh, robot, robots to insert these different components. So if you need to switch out a rich filter, put another aperture in, put a composite in, why not using a little robot to do that uh, very fast, very effectively, take it off the shelf and put it in. It's just a thought, right? What do we know about image guidance for flash? We need very accurate patient positioning, and that is to avoid delivering the entire beam in the wrong place. Uh, contrary to our initial thoughts, we still need to deliver conformal doses, more one fraction, which really means we need to uh, deliver the beam extremely accurately to, to use tight margins, reduce the proton, and, and in order to deliver tight margins, we need to reduce the range of, of the beam and uncertainty of the range, and we need to do in situ range verification. We really need improved image guidance at ISA Center. Now, it's obvious to, if you look at this slide here and look at the typical gantry paradigm, up to now, we've only been able to put cone beam CT at ISA Center of the gantries and X rays, and some gantries we have in room CT, which is way off ISA Center. But in this paradigm here on the right, when we use a fixed room, now we can suddenly have all these advanced imaging, dual energy CT, proton radiography and many other things at ISA Center that really allows us to do much, much more precise and better image guidance uh, at ISA Center. And the only thing you have sacrificed is the gantry, but if we have a very smart patient positioner that we're developing, we can uh, achieve multiple beam angles. Here's just a, a summary of what we have. We have this patient positioner, we have the dual energy CT scanner, but then also on the right here, you see the PRAD system. This is a system that can be uh, inserted around the patient. You have a front detector, you have a delta E, a, a back detector, and a delta E detector behind. The beam comes through, runs through the patients, and, uh, and of course, the 230 MeV beam need to, uh, cannot go through all parts of the body, but it can go through the most parts of the body. And if you do the analysis, you see that you actually can image those tumors that really need to be imaged with proton radiography. We're working with Cozy Lab to develop a so-called position one software that will allow to accommodate these PRAD uh, images. So what you see in this panel is the PRAD here of a pig head. In the bottom is the uh, proton radio calculated from the X-ray CT data. Uh, so you're using your stopping power conversion um, methods to calculate the stopping power. Then you calculate the, the PRAD and you compare with the measure and you can compare the difference map. Now, how sensitive is this? And here we can see this movie is running here. We can see on the left-hand side here, we shifting, and, and when I say we, it's really the work of Mark Pankook and uh, Fritz de Jong and the team of Proton VDA, together with the team at uh, Northwestern uh, Proton Therapy Center. You can see here on the left, we're shifting the peaks at 0. 0.3 tenths of a millimeter, and you can see how dramatically the difference in the, in the difference map is on the right. So I am convinced that the software will be able to pick up down to the 0.3 tenths of a millimeter shift. If we look at rotation here on the left, now you see the pig head is actually rotating and we can see the dramatic change in the, in the difference map just for a very half a degree rotation. So I'm, I'm uh, making the point here that PRAD for the areas where we really need precision will, will really be a, con allow us to make a total paradigm shift in the accuracy of setting up the patient life. So in summary, the LEO uh, 
Leo designed, uh, Leo designed and are building now radiotherapy specific imaging solutions to incorporate dual energy CT at ISIS center and uh, P, this is a mistake, I should say P rad in the treatment position, not PCT. Uh, and uh, both of these are supporting flash treatments. In the future, the fixed beam operate treatment rooms equipped with the Leo technology will accommodate flash nozzles, provide the required IDGRT solutions for flash and accommodate multiple types of nozzles, ocular treatments, flash, large field grid. So that's my story about the, the future treatment room that will allow these things and uh, make a huge step forward. But the next area uh, part of our presentation is then to go switch over to the detector, to Marco, to tell us what they are doing in, in collaboration with us and us in collaboration with them to say, how do we actually measure the beam? So I'm going to stop my share and hand over to, uh, to Marco. Then. Okay. Hello to everybody. I'm Marco Lavagna from Detector. So I would like to thank uh, uh, Leo Cancer Care, in particular Nick for the first part of the webinar and Fiona for the organization and the presentation. A uh, few words on uh, our company, on Detector. Uh, we are a company established in uh, Torino, Italy since 2009. We are a spin-off company of the University of Turin. And we design and develop devices for uh, particle therapy, in particular, two-way devices, beam two-way devices to be placed at the ISO center, and uh, uh, beam monitoring systems to be placed at, at the node for measurement and control of the beam during treatments. Uh, these are our installations. Uh, most of them are uh, in, uh, in Europe, where we cover a few, uh, few facilities there with uh, both two-way system and beam monitoring system for both treatment rooms and experimental rooms. Uh, we're going to deliver also our first beam monitoring uh, system in China soon. Uh, basically, uh, we um, have a strong collaboration that you can see also afterwards, uh, also for, for flash therapy experiments for the, with, with the Alum Particle Therapy Center in, uh, in Delft that have all the, the, our uh, QA devices and the beam monitoring system for the R&D line. So just, uh, I start with a, an overview, uh, a concept for our beam monitoring system. So Nick before um, described you uh, the, the treatment room, the future treatment room uh, um, concept uh, for uh, uh, in a, in a uh, for the imaging and treatment and positioning point of view. He also uh, uh, described the nozzle, and uh, we uh, propose solutions for the nozzle in, in, with, with beam monitoring systems. Uh, where we have the technology that is uh, integral, uh, sorry, uh, incision chambers connected to a front-end electronics that is a dedicated front-end electronics developed uh, back in the days by uh, Institute of Nuclear Physics and the university. Uh, that's the Terra chip that was established uh, uh, in uh, several beam monitors, uh, like the one in Knau, that is our longtime partner. So basically, this is the concept and uh, we can customize it for the needs of the, uh, of, the, of the customer and of the experiments. So that can be installed both in treatment rooms and experimental rooms. It can be uh, the handles in the, in that, uh, in the monitors may be uh, fixed or strip or integral following different uh, measurements. So like for the 2D measurements or the particle flux, then there is an embedded software inside. And that customization of course led to uh, having also solutions for uh, ultra high dose rates or uh, pulsed beams, uh, and so also for flash therapy beams. Um, this kind of concept so um, can be um, tuned uh, for for that kind of intensities. Uh, having a new front end electronics we developed uh, in uh, in the last years uh, that extend uh, the intensity range, the capability for the front end electronics to catch uh, highest uh, uh, beam intensities. Uh, and also that ionization chamber itself uh, can be pushed to the limits to overcome the recombination effect. Uh, the, the goal is to have uh, uh, an all-in-one solution uh, for both the uh, clinic, what, what are the nowadays the, the clinical ranges and also the, the future flash uh, rates. So uh, this, this kind of uh, technique, this uh, work we are carrying out with, uh, uh, in, in our R&D department, 
uh, is also um, uh, is also uh, done in uh, in the QA devices. That these are our catalog products we um, developed uh, in the last uh, two three years. We have uh, devices for full uh, uh, range, full clinical range uh, setup like CubeNext, NextQA 360 for beam measurements of bright peak, 2D beam, uh, uh, profiles and the dimension of the beam and the intensity of the beam. And then we have also QI accuracy in Q plus the three devices conceived for uh, our ocular treatments. Uh, all these devices are only one devices with a dedicated web-based raw data software uh, and uh, also a QA platform the IQ can be included. If you're interested, of course, in having a demo, uh, both online demo with a software uh, where we can show you the software features or even a live demo on Beam, we are pleased to uh, arrange that. So please write us because, because we can uh, uh, test these devices on, uh, on site. So starting from that, um, our first, um, let's say, tests were carried out on NextQ. That is a strip detector with a sensitive error 30 by 30 centimeters square, used for uh, QA procedures and commissioning uh, strip X and Y with one millimeter pitch, uh, with also integral chambers inside to measure the path of flux. So basically, um, we, we started from here, uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, in collaboration with the, the Olam Practical Therapy Center, which started to uh, have. Um, uh, and we try those red beans in their R&D line. We uh, start to develop a new concept, so an upgrade of the next few in order to catch the, the highest intensities. Um, we um, installed in the, in, uh, in the new device, uh, the, the new front end called Tero 9, developed a couple of years ago by us with Diana Fanny University, uh, which uh, has the possibility to catch currents from a uh, few uh, picoamps uh, to hundreds of uh, microamps. So we extend a lot the, uh, the range in intensity, and we also change the setup of a ionization chamber. Uh, that uh, that to, led to the, a new device called Flash Q, that basically is the next Q with the same setup for the strip, but tuned for highest uh, uh, intensity. So to overcome the recombination effect and uh, to, to catch the ultra idols rate. Uh, that was released in uh, and, uh, and tested and delivered in uh, in June, so a few months ago, and that was the first test we did in all parts of the center. So they already have the next queue there, uh, and we test the integral chamber for the next uh, of the next queue and of the flash queue. And basically, we saw that uh, uh, next queue saturates at around 300 nominal beam current in the machine, while flash queue. Uh, could be linear, is linear until 800 nanohams in the machine. That's around 380 nanohams uh, at the target. The same measurement then was repeated for uh, um, the, a work for the PTCOG in North America that was presented last month by Marta Robisuzo, physicist at the uh, RD line in Delft at all on PTC, with a comparison between uh, uh, BMI01, that's our uh, beam monitor for the uh, particle flux measurements and feedback with the variant machine, uh, which includes two uh, integral chamber for the redundant measurement of intensity and flash cube. And basically, we, we obtain uh, the, the same result. Uh, so uh, the saturation of the BMI01, that of course uh, has to be uh, tuned and has to be upgraded for that kind of uh, to. to measure and uh, have a feedback, of course, for that kind of rates, uh, while flash Q is um, linear up to 390 nanohams at the target. So I would like to thank, of course, Marta Vituso for, the, for all the graphs and for all the data and results. Uh, then um, uh, also, of course, pencil beam characterization was done in the, uh, with, with flash Q, uh, considering a, a test, this is, um, uh, at uh, 50 nanoamps, 150 MeV uh, at the ISO center of X profile and Y profile to characterize uh, the, the dimension and the position of the beam at that rate. Uh, the idea so is uh, to develop, um, we, we started of course with that kind of uh, device, uh, 
uh, that is a strip device. But the idea is that we to, to develop also a flash queue for with, with pixel chamber instead of strip. Uh, that of course may give a 2D response, a shape response of the beam. Uh, and uh, with, with a 0.4 millimeter resolution. So pixel detector instead of strip, we already developed in the past uh, different uh, um, pixel uh, anodes for, for our chamber. Uh, as for the flash queue with strip, uh, it would be uh, an only one solution as all of our QA devices, which includes the control system, the capability also to catch and to have a software inside and resident in the device. So uh, without any external software to install in your laptop. So it will be also uh, an easy and uh, uh, friendly way to acquire the, the, the device. Uh, during this month, there were also, um, we were also thinking about uh, having, the, we also had the possibility to test with the uh, rates, highest rates also, and the devices like the CubeNex that is in uh, all MPC. Uh, CubeNex is a stack of ionization chamber to measure the bracket curves with a resolution of 2.4 millimeter in water. It has a modular design, so it may uh, change in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, number of channels, so in uh, energy range. Uh, basically, that was tested uh, up to 50 nanograms of the target at 250 MeV, and so uh, we uh, obtained the, the graphic curve as well. Of course, this is not conceived for that kind of measurement. Um, it's uh, it's uh, uh, more it's for conventional uh, rates to uh, have a monthly QA uh, in uh, of, of the of the peaks of the uh, the, the, those measurements. Uh, but we have also other solutions for highest rates, they uh, for highest. Um, rates like uh, with the QI, that is uh, a device conceived for ocular proton beam lines uh, with a different uh, concept instead of uh, cube because it's uh, a multi-layer Faraday cap uh, to measure the depth, depth of curve. So, so basically the same uh, output with a different concept. Uh, of course, reduces the energy range because it arrives up to 70 uh, MeV from one MeV to 70 MeV with a very high Natural resolution of 0 0.12 uh, millimeters. The idea here is uh, since you have a direct measurement of the proton beam, is uh, to test it also with uh, uh, flash rates in order to understand also its response. And also, uh, another application is uh, with electrons because we have the, the possibility to measure both uh, positive and negative currents thanks to our front end electronics. Uh, and uh, and so uh, also another application for this device can be uh, the intraoperative radiation therapy where flash rate is an hot topic too. So to sum up, uh, we uh, the next steps would be to uh, uh, carry out further tests with the flash queue to optimize uh, the concept. We have also a demo a demo version of the flash queue here in the house that can be used and tested in other environments with other accelerators. Uh, continue with the development of flash cube pixel for the 2D measurements. Uh, acquire optimization for both proton and electrons rates, flash rates. And then of course, uh, what is uh, also already introduced by me, um, having uh, the possibility of uh, uh, develop a beam monitoring system, which is a uh, unique uh, and uh, an only one solution for both conventional and ultra high dose rates, uh, alongside, of course, our partners at Bio Cancer Care to, to have a, a sort of an environment uh, which includes patient positioning, uh, imaging, and also the monitoring system ready for the next future uh, and flash there. So, thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks again to Bio Cancer Care. This is our website, vector-group.com, if you would like to. Uh, have more uh, information on our uh, products, of course, you can contact us. I think that we can start with the Q&A session. So thanks all of you. Thank you to our presenters. We will now take any questions you may have. Um, please send them through if you haven't done so already, and we will answer as many as possible. Um, so we do have one question that's come through that says, do the flash dose rates induce high background noise? Yeah, um, 
that that's clearly a thing. Let, let me first talk about that. I think there is definitely a, a, a challenge out there to figure out exactly how to deal with a flash. Uh, at this point, we, we from our side uh, is the induced activity. We need to we need to continue to investigate that. Uh, but Marco, maybe you can address the noise in the detectors and what do you guys see there? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, it's it's. Um, um, we used to say, I don't know if uh, it's already in English, that uh, the blanket is short. So if you if you change the the, um, uh, the range from one side or to the other, you have some uh, um, uh, some parts that are not covered. Let's say. Uh, so basically, of course, uh, uh, increasing the capability uh, of the of the detector, in particular, to to have uh, um, uh, to catch the highest rate uh, rates. Uh, you uh, introduce more noise in your system, of course, that's true. Uh, what we are uh, dealing with is having uh, um, a setup of immunization chambers inside the CMB monitor uh, to measure uh, both low and highest currents. So to increase uh, at maximum the possibility of uh, catching the, the, the beam currents. So uh, of course, uh, I, I mean, to be honest, uh, flash Q that is tuned for IS current, uh, introduce, uh, th there you have an IS, an IR background because it's conceived to measure uh, the, the IS current. Uh, but basically uh, having the capability and uh, the, the possibility to tune your system, to tune your electronics uh, in terms of having uh, uh, both uh, the, the measurements for conventional and clinical rates and flash rates that is feasible with, uh, let's say, uh, 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 a double setup in the same, uh, same monitor and the same device. Okay, and we've got another one here. Is it possible to have timing information of each pulse for high doses of flash? What is the accuracy of measurement for each pulse? Marco, can you take that one as well? Uh, yeah. Um, so what, uh, here we are talking about pulsed beams, I think. Uh, am I right? Because uh, each pulse for high dose of flash, uh, the accuracy of measurements for each pulse. So uh, if we are talking about pulsed beam, uh, I mean, uh, I will say that, that uh, of course, it's uh, I mean, a little bit different topic because there you have uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, not, the number of particles are uh, all concentrated in a small amount of time. Uh, basically, as far as I know, there are systems in, uh, that are going to be developed uh, with that kind of technique. Uh, and uh, and uh, as far as I know, we're talking about, we're talking about uh, uh, okay, uh, I'm reading now each pulse is around 10 microseconds for all proton beam. Uh, okay. Yeah, I would, uh, let me just jump in here, Marco. I would yeah. think that if there was a pulse process, I would not think it would be uh, linear with those rates. So yeah. um, I do think you're capturing it. I think part of the question is uh, yeah, whether you can derive the timing information from your electronics to see, I'm, I'm seeing the, the detection and, and, and give feedback and say, I'm seeing pulses that that is the timing structure of the pulses basically coming back from the detector, right? Yeah, ba yeah. basically we have the capability to catch, let's say uh, a, a time structure of, I would say around uh, uh, one mega, so one microsecond. So I think that our electronic is capable to do that. Uh, we have an electronic without the, the time. So uh, we have a continuous measurement. Uh, of course, uh, that would, if we're talking about 10 microseconds for, uh, uh, we can also see the structure inside the, the beam in, in, in terms of uh, time structure for the, for the particle flux. Uh, and then, of course, we, uh, we are also developing systems for a sort of uh, feedback and, uh, and uh, data transmission to be as fast as possible to uh, react and, and uh, uh, interface with, with the control system. Okay, so there's quite a lot coming in, so I'm trying yeah. to keep up. So um, with high intensity of radiation, do you need to cool down your detector? Uh, well, um, this is no, uh, uh, the, the, the cool down of the detector is mostly based on uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, the number of electronics we, we have inside. So it's not much related to the intensity of the beam. Uh, what is, uh, I mean, needed, of course, is sort of cooling in some of our devices that is uh, like in FreshQ, we have a, a sort of cooling system. So it's something that we already implemented. And of course, uh, in, in terms of, it, it, it depends on, on the setup, it depends on the, on the electronics. Okay. Um, what is limiting the one, I'm guessing this, kilohertz DAQ rate, is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, are there plans to push to even higher DAQ rates? Um, yeah, okay, the, the um, one killer that the accurate is uh, basically mostly related to QA systems. Uh, this is something that we established uh, as, let's say, as a limit, even if it's not a limit of the electronic of the system. Uh, since, as I said before, we can, uh, uh, I mean, have a response of around even better than uh, of one, one, let's say, one megahertz in terms of uh electronic uh response uh so is it can be pushed to a higher the rate of course uh this is a setup we established for the beam qa systems and for our catalog products then of course uh, the customization and also the fresh therapy developments may lead to lead to a, a different uh setup Okay, um, we've got another one here that says, what is the estimated timeline for the launch of the commercial product, which has DECT and PRAD for the LEO system? Yeah, <clears throat> I'll take that. So the, the, the official timeline is to have everything FDA approved towards the end of next year, end of 2022, um, get all the filings in, and then we'll just see how we go through the process. So clinical utilization is uh, scheduled for... Uh, the beginning of 2023. Okay, great. Um, then we've got another one. How easy slash fast would it be to switch the patient positioner from upright to supine? Yeah, I, I have to uh, clarify that. You know, this is currently in our design primarily focusing on or an imaging device so that we can image supine. And uh, we think about uh, five to 10 minutes to, to switch the, basically pull the backrest out, put the new device on top and then convert it in. Now, if you're in the treatment room, now we have, uh, it's, it's not going to be very easy to do full isocentric rotation if the dual image imager, imager is installed in the same place. So that discussion becomes a little bit more complicated. Also, how are you going to do image guidance in the supine position? So to answer your question in the, in the pure diagnostic imaging space on the ADA apparatus, we're aiming for a time of five to 10 minutes to do the conversion. Okay, great. Then in, any damage to your detector from high intensity proton beam? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's a good question. <laughs> of course, neutrons are uh, something that uh, uh, we, I mean, uh, it, um, I will start with that, with that. I mean, we have some of our devices established in um, um, facilities uh, since, uh, I mean, years. I mean, since we, where we started 2009. Uh, we have the experience of our partner think now that they, they treat patients since 2011 with the same technology, let's say, same content, same, uh, let's say, interfaces, uh, and, and basically no big damages in, in, uh, in years. Of course, neutrons is something that we uh, cannot prevent and cannot understand. It's uh, uh, an electronic board. Uh, I mean, it is. I mean, if, if we see a damage in an electronic box, we never know if it could be a new, neutron or not. At the moment, uh, with the experiment we carried out with uh, the with, uh, fresh therapy rates uh, in uh, Olam Particle Therapy Center, we didn't experience that, especially because if we're talking about QA systems, uh, I don't think that, uh, I mean, it's just a, a measurement, uh, I mean, let's say daily measurement, but not a constant uh, rate. Uh, so, of course, we already think about and uh, let's say, um, think about shieldings uh, for, for the part that are, of course, more sensitive. About the front end electronics, I'm pretty sure, and, uh, and a lot of tests also with the uh, of radiation outlets were carried out uh, during the development of the, of the front end electronics. That's, that's the one next to the, to the ionization chamber. Then, of course, uh, the 
the spread the spread of neutrons is uh, 360 degrees all around so uh, it's something that uh, you cannot prevent but in principle uh, at the moment uh, we are just thinking about several shieldings and from the experience in the conventional uh, with the conventional rates we didn't have uh, issues in the past let's say okay um do you perform 2d dose reconstruction from the strips or do you just use the strips for the position and profile information and use the integral chamber for the dose information? Uh, yeah, we, um, well, we use the strips uh, basically for position and profile information uh, and use the, the, the integral chamber for, uh, for the dose information. So let's say for the, for the particle flux information, yes. Uh, for the 2D dose reconstruction, I would say that uh, uh, probably it's better to have a pixel device because, of course, we have a direct uh, shape uh, of the beam and not just the projection of the beam in X and Y. Yep. Um, and we'll, we've got one last one here. That is, have you ever evaluated the radiation hardness of the whole system? Yeah, I think that question is, uh, I mean, I think both of us should answer that. I think uh, Mark already touched a little bit on that, but we have done an extensive uh, review of the literature to look at our apparatus, the CT scanner, the x tiles, the, the stuff in the treatment room for the standard uh, paradigm of uh, pencil beam scanning. And uh, the data is overwhelmingly positive that we will have, I think some of our calculations says we'll have 100 years of safe operation before we expect the first failure. Now, we're not happy with just uh, extrapolating for published data. So we are going to take some of these X tiles and components of the CT scanner and, and put them in actual neutron beams and a neutron test lab to, to test that. Now, when it comes to flash, of course, the, this really question is, of course, much more related to flash. Now, the big unknown is what is the work rate? Are you going to treat five patients per hour with flash? Means the dose is now uh, you know, 20 or 30 gray and which all relate to more protons. And so clearly there's a lot of questions out there and we need to do the evaluation based on that kind of uh, dose rate and also the fact you have to degrade to close to the patient. So we're still looking into that uh, paradigm. Uh, I still believe we should be fine because I don't think we'll ever treat that many patients per hour uh, because flash will be highly precision uh, treatments and, and there will be an SRS uh, highly precise setup. So we're still doing that work. The initial indications we should just be fine because also the CT scanner is in a retracted position way up in the air about uh, one and a half meter away from the beam line. And there's really nothing in the patient position that could be sensitive to, to failure. Um, if we need to go to radiation art specific components, we can go that direction, but for the, for the moment, we believe we're just perfectly fine. Very good question, and uh, we are actively working on that and physically planning to do physical measurements on the sensitive components. So Marco, I think you've already addressed that, but you can maybe allude to that as well. Yeah, yeah, basically, uh, we, we already did uh, some radiation measurements, uh, as I said before, on the front channel electronic, that is basically the most, let's say, sensitive electronic part in the system. So is we did it. Uh, we have some publication on that. Uh, we did experiments with neutrons uh, that were carried out a couple of years ago. Uh, basically, with, with the latest uh, front end uh, uh, electronic version, but it's something that we, uh, I mean, historically was already uh, made, always made by by uh, University of Turin and INFN that had, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, developed the previous version of the of the KR chip of the electronics. So that's all we have time for today. Um, thank you for your engagement, and we hope you all enjoyed the webinar. Thanks a thank lot. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.